Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter Select, a seasonal retrospective podcast where we bounce back and forth between a series exploring its evolution, design, and legacy. For this season, we are covering the Pokemon franchise. My name is Max Roberts, and I'm joined, as always, by Logan Moore. Hi, Logan. This game is a brilliant turd, a shining mess. (laughs) I will not have you besmirch the good name of Diamond and Pearl. I will not stand for this slander. I'm coming right out the gate, making it clear where I stand with this game, which I don't think is much of a surprise because I'm pretty sure in past episodes I've already said, like, I don't really like Diamond and Pearl that much. Diamond and Pearl is a very good game. But you know what else is good, Logan? What's that? Our members who support us over Super Chapter Select, where you can get longer episodes, more discussion as well, exclusive episodes. We may we were just talking about we might be doing one here for Pokemon if Logan will ever play Legends Arceus, which ties directly into Diamond and Pearl. So there's all that. It and does, then yeah. Our uh, extra bonus video content, like for season six here, we have our Pokemon battles. This uh, Diamond and Pearl, this will be our seventh battle. So you can check those out and see where we stand in this season-long grudge, which may go past black and white too, as we've talked about, maybe bringing everything forward to Scarlet and Violet for one last hurrah, or maybe playing the stadium games as well. So if all that sounds cool and you'd just like to support the show, you could do so over at listeningwithsuperpower.com for just $20 a year. So head on over to listeningwithsuperpower.com. And thank you to all our members who do so already. Good URL. Thank you. One will have to actually continue to remember Keep. exists yeah <laughs> well, I was yeah oh, remember exists oh I know it exists I just thought yeah I, you do but I, I, I re- if I recall you filled me in late that that was a thing like hey I bought this domain and I was like what so, <laughs> yeah um, domains are so cheap man <laughs> they are they it's are the nowadays best. Max let's not waste any time this episode let's get right into our rundown and then because there's a lot I want to say, and there's a lot you want to say, and I, I think this is going to be one of our more interesting sort of back and forth episodes because of where we're both coming from. Coming coming from with this game. Uh, again, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl was developed by Game Freak. Uh, Max and I did play the remakes this time around, and those were developed by, is it Ilka or Ilsa? I think ILCA. I think or it stands I-L-C-A. for like I Love Computer Art is what I was reading up on is what it stands for let's do that uh the games originally released on april 22nd 2007 for the nintendo ds the remakes launched back in 2021 on nintendo switch the original game director was junichi masuda Uh, the producers of the originals were hiroyuki jenai gakujiri nomoto hitoshi yamagami and hiroaki suru and then the music was done by go ichinose Junichi Masuda and Hitomi Sato. Uh, the Metacritic scores on the original games were an 85 out of 100. You noted that Platinum had a lower score, which is correct because um, what is that Pokemon's name? I don't even. Uh, Palkia Dude. is worse than Dialga. No, um, I'm sorry. It well, yes, that is true. Palkia. Oh, is I'm worse. sorry. That's for that's, that's for Platinum. Platinum. That's Platinum. for Platinum, not Pearl. I'm sorry. No, Pearl that's has the same uh, score. Okay, interesting, interesting. And then the, uh, I'll just throw this out there, the remakes were panned largely, 73 out of 100. Now, panned, I, seven, that's still a passing grade, that's a C. I, I, I do want to just say, I'm not defending the games here, I'm just talking numbers here. 7 out of 10 is not a bad game. I just want to... Yeah, no, I I think I, that I agree mindset is bad. Um, a bad I game have, would be I, like 5 or 4. Now, it is a worse score, it, it's hard because I have that same mindset as you, and that's a mindset I have when I am personally reviewing games. Like if I give mm-hmm. a game a three or a three and a half or something, I'm like, that's a good score. I think I like I enjoyed lo- portions of this game. Uh, I just know that most other gaming outlets, especially those on Metacritic, um, anything below a seven is where you start to get into like this game sucks territory. A lot of <laughs> outlets only use seven and above. And, and then why not just do a one out of three scale, I guess. I, numbers are dumb in review scores to begin I with. I think numbers are good. The problem is that people don't use the full scale. Like, that's that's the issue. I think I think if we could break our... 
I'll say this. The problem actually for us in America is uh, our grade system because I think we are we are bred to think that anything below 70 is failing because that's what it is in school for us. <laughs> so that's Perhaps. probably where that derives from, I have always believed. Um, it's a darn education system. But yeah. Max, we'll start with you and your history on this one because I know this is the one that you have... It's, an extensive this is history all I have, with. Logan. I've saved this up. This is all you have. <laughs> I've saved up you six have episodes no, of <laughs> history. You have no histories episode. with anything else moving forward. So uh, I have a little bit with X, but yeah, you're right. This um this is my great return to Pokemon as a as a kid. So listeners may remember back at the beginning of this season, I was I had Pokemon Blue and I was and the Pokemon cards, the whole deal. And my parents thought I was too obsessed with it and made me get rid of it all in a pretty horrific way. I had to shred all my Pokemon cards and get rid of the games. You, Logan, you just found all your old Pokemon cards and I was seeing the cards that I had. I did. And it caused me great pain, like actually seeing the cards themselves because I really haven't seen them in 20 years. Your parents should be forced to pay you in damages (laughs) because those cards are so expensive now. I send them articles when like a charizard goes for hundreds of thousands of dollars i'm like yeah did you have a charizard yeah oh that's insane like one of the og holographic charizards i remember having a charizard i cannot speak to if it was og or holographic i remember having a charizard i remember you had one of the original sets like at a minimum those are about 180 to 200 dollars now i think that's crazy i remember missing my <laughs> bus stop in kindergarten because i was trading pokemon cards with other kids in the back of the bus and the bus driver was furious with me so yeah i've I, so left pokemon in some time in elementary school and then come back here to the nintendo ds and the release of diamond in 2007 so i'm 13 years old uh, it was going to be my 13th birthday actually in that june and I kind of read Nintendo Power, went online, was reading all about it, and made this big portfolio of all these articles to like prove to my parents that I was old enough and mature enough at the ripe young age of 13 to play Pokemon. And this actually also coincided with Zelda and the Phantom Hourglass. I was like, I'm old enough to play these games again, because they did the same thing with Zelda, because it had a witch in it. And so... They said yes, and that birthday, a few months later, was like the Pokemon blowout, where I got not only Pokemon Diamond, but also Pokemon Ranger, I specifically asked for because I wanted to get a Manaphy, and that's the only way at the time to get a Manaphy, was to play Ranger, transfer the egg. I remember this. I I never bit on Ranger, personally. I think I just... Range, I Man. remember having fun with it, the whole draw circles around it. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. those, I think the third Ranger game is actually quite expensive. Yeah, one of them's really expensive. The first one I know isn't, to my knowledge, but one of I those don't believe so. But the th- I think is... the third one is pretty pricey. So I only played the first one, and then I would actually eventually go on to get Mystery Dungeon, Blue Rescue Team, and then also Explorers of Time. So. You know, this you was were like, going way harder than I was in this era. Like well, I was a Pokemon kid, and I wasn't even—I I didn't play any of those spinoffs. Well, I was so starved at the time. And yeah, s- and I, the DS was the thing, and I—it's probably the handheld I've played the most. And I just was pouring everything into it. Now, hindsight, probably should have been going to GameStop and buying those older games that I had missed because yeah. I would have made a killing. Um, I would eventually get some of those cartridges later on, but then I'd sell them. It's a whole story Uh, filled with regret. So I'm back and I'm playing Diamond and I'm obsessed with it, right? I think the final clock was like 120, 130 hours. I went all out in this game. And once I beat it and, you know, had my fill with it, then I got an action replay. So then I'm in there hacking the game and having fun with that. So then I'm using like Pokesov to make Pokemon on the computer. I even made YouTube tutorials like here's how you do this. And I would give Pokemon the crazy moves and abilities. So like I really (laughs) just was living in in Sinnoh. Did these Pokemon tutorials still exist on the internet somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll throw one in the show notes. I'll throw them in the show notes. And then Platinum would come out a year or two, two years later really, which is wow. 
But I remember following the news for that in Japan, and I got platinum, and I played that a ton too. Giratina's cool. I still have my Giratina figure that I got for pre-ordering the game. I really, this was the generation I came back, and then I didn't pick up black and white. I didn't pick up black and white too. <laughs> I don't know why. I That's did v- get, very I, strange, actually. Yeah, yeah that you were I didn't so get hard gold, soul, it. silver. I think I skipped gold and silver. Because I was like, I didn't play those games. And it would have been the perfect time to play them, right? I don't know. My brain yeah. was just like, I didn't do it. And so uh, I wouldn't come back to Pokemon again until X. And I kind of dropped off of that quickly. Um, I'm sure we'll discover that in the coming episodes. Probably maybe why that happened. And then really, I didn't come back. Arceus was the la- the last game I played before we did this season of like yeah really digging into and ironically that's Sinnoh as well right so I have this is this is the game I'm most nostalgic for this is the decks I'm most nostalgic for which I think is actually really funny now having the context of six other games and kind of looking at where Sinnoh sits so <laughs> but it's there is the nostalgia. Now, coming into the episode, I knew that would be so strong with me, almost like Sapphire and Ruby were for you to a yeah, yeah. And so I did try to, I wanted to separate that as much as possible because uh, there, are, there are some like Pokemon issues with this game, uh, um, which is interesting to have. But my nostalgia has softened that uh, reaction, I think, just personally. But the critical eye sees it and acknowledges it for sure and i'm sure we'll talk about all of this but i'm really curious where you are because i would think as a kid you know you were playing the game boy advance games mm-hmm. the game boy games the ds comes out the logical thing is pokemon's coming to the ds and it does mm-hmm. with diamond and pearl where were you back in 2007 what were you doing so i bought these games on day one i was there i had pre-ordered them i was you hyped. got both uh, I got diamond. My brother got pearl, and we pre-ordered that's, them. At that's what games. happened with me and my brother. And we got them at GameStop, and they gave us the special edition styluses. And I still have my Dialga ones somewhere. You can look this up if you would Dialga like. Styles. They had like they had like a special edition stylus that came with it. Um, that just had like Dialga at the top of it, like a little oh my gosh <laughs> figure of Dialga there at the top. And so I got that, and I was playing it. Yeah, I was hyped as can be for this, um, and I played through it. I uh, got to the <laughs> end. So this is this is the weird thing about Diamond for me. So, like in the moment, I didn't like the first playthrough. I didn't really dislike the game, and I think I played through it maybe a couple times actually. Um, did you just send me this? Oh yeah, there mm-hmm. it is. That's yep. it. Yeah, that's so, it. Right that's awesome. And then there's a Palkia one too. So anyway. I, I played through the game. I liked it. I may have played through it a time or two. And then because I had been playing everything up to this point, you know, I had all my old Pokemon on my GBA games and they allowed you to transfer them via the Pow Park, which you unlocked at the end of Diamond, which was a whole, which is not I, really a thing in the remakes here that we played. Can I just say yeah. something really quick? Yeah. How cool is it that the Nintendo DS would let you put in a Game Boy Advance game and you could link it between the DS cart? Like you you didn't need two systems anymore. Like that blew my mind as a kid. Not that I used that feature because I didn't yeah. have those games, but I do remember like Mystery Dungeon. If you had Fire Red or um Red Rescue Team and Blue Rescue Team, the two could talk to each other. I just yeah. thought that was so neat. I it was really cool and I liked having I liked being able to get all my Pokemon that meant something to me from my leaf green and sapphire runs and my emerald runs and bring them over i wish it wouldn't have limited it to six a day i wish you could have just done a mass import like i don't know if you knew how that functioned but you would have to go to the park you'd have to have the cartridge in that you wanted to import them from you would have to select six and then you would have to go catch them and then it would say like that's it for today and then you couldn't go back until 24 hours later and then you have to do it again. So if you wanted to like mass You had import, to catch like, them? Yes. Like basically you would just run around in the grass and then they would show up and there was only the option to throw ball. And it would catch. And you would just, and it it would would just be, catch okay. right away. Yeah. So but you would have to like catch them. And so it was like a long import process. And I wish you could have done it more quickly. Anyway, so I did all of that and I played, like I said, I played the game a couple times. 
I don't know. Here's the weird thing about Diamond for me. And I wasn't really... I don't know what my thought process was here. Um, and this is by far the worst thing I have ever done that still haunts me to this day. Oh, At no. some point, I just was like, you know, I had this diamond cart that had dozens and hundreds of Pokemon on it that I had tr trained up across different games, different platforms, different everything. I was just like, you know, I'll sell it to GameStop. And I traded it in for some reason. I don't you, know why. I know why you did it. It's the same because reason I, I traded money. in my Cut. Pokemon games because it was worth 30, 40 bucks. Okay, yeah, because I'm a kid and I don't have a job and I want the whatever the hot new game is that's about to come mm -hmm. out. So yeah, that's yeah. why I did it. But something like I told myself like, ah, I'm not really into Pokemon and I don't, I'm not really into this anymore. And that's true. I did think the post game of Diamond was not great. I didn't think there was like much to do compared to Ruby and Sapphire, which just felt so... I mean, maybe this wasn't true at the time, but it just felt like there was so much more to kind of explore and uncover in those games. Like we, when we played those, like there was the whole, you know, underground areas and the different, like, like the different uh, walls and stuff you could read that are all made out of, like, there's a lot of like secret stuff in those games that you could just straight up never see. Um, but there's a lot of that in these games too, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I was going to say, there's, a there lot is, of, there's stuff there, in here that you a, totally can skip. There's a lot of le legendaries. Is Reggie Gygus in this game or Reg Reggie Gygus? I believe so, yes. I remember, I think, getting them. Um, I think so. Darkrai, yeah. Shaman, Rotom. Well, Darkrai and Shaman. Darkrai and Shaman. They were event Pokemon. Yeah, they were event stuff. But it, it was like Giratina, Heatran, uh, Reg Reggie Gygus, Reggie, Reggie Gygus, however you say it. Yeah. Arceus, um, I think. Uh, or, or was Arceus Arceus event? was another event, yeah. Um, so yeah, like there was like legendaries and stuff like that you could catch post game, but then there really just didn't seem to be a whole lot else. Anyway, long story short, I sold it <laughs> at some point, and I'm not really sure why. Um, or wait, no, oh yeah, Rigid I guess was Gen Four. There it is. Um, so yeah, I just sold it, and I I mean the weird thing is I I don't know what my thought process was at the time. Again, it probably was just as simple as I would like money and I'm not playing this game anymore because it, it, then moving forward, it wasn't like I then didn't get, you know, Heart Gold and Soul Silver and Black and Black and White, Black and White too. Like I was still buying every, it wasn't really until, because then I bought X and Y right away and I bought Sun and Moon right away. It wasn't it was until, ultra, right? yeah, no, I bought Sun and Moon right away at launch. I just didn't play it. I bounced off. And then Omega and Ruby, I didn't buy at launch, but I got a little later and then I bounced off that too. It wasn't until, I guess, yeah, Ultra's uh, Sun and Moon, I, I I never grabbed. Like, cause then when and we get to the Switch, when we get to, yeah, uh, Sword and Shield, I've had since launch, but I didn't, I just never played until we did it for this show. Um, so I've still like had and purchased all the Pokemon games like at or around launch. So anyway, I don't know why I, abandoned shipped on diamond and sold my cart that had everything on it because <laughs> like that that haunts me now because like we're doing this season like and if i still had that cart with like 20 year old pokemon on it that would just be so cool to me yeah um yeah. like even though it's i mean at the end of the day it's just whatever you know ones and zeros that's all it yeah, is. Well, yeah, it's just a, a, a freaking, a Rayquaza is a Rayquaza, but it's like, it would be way cooler if it's the Rayquaza that I was fighting to capture in Pokemon Sapphire when I lived in Cordova Drive back in Indian Indianapolis. So, yeah, I don't know. There's like a, there's, a, there's that sort of element to it. Anyway. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally get that. That it's your Pokemon, right? And then. Yeah they're gone because you it's like having a dog getting rid of the dog and then you're like oh man i wish i didn't get rid of that dog <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? I don't know. it in a weird way it's there is a nostalgia to it and i think the cool thing is is i don't think from here on out really i'd say i guess the ds era 3ds era more concretely with pokemon bank but nothing we'll never lose pokemon again if you keep no, paying for subscriptions, and, yeah. yeah, you like I will never lose this batch, of, this Torterra, this 
Garchomp. Like I'll never, I'll never sell like s- sell the game. I don't lose the Pokemon. The Pokemon are with me now, which I think is a really good thing for this franchise to maintain. What's funny though is that I say all of that and I like kind of reminisce and I'm nostalgic about this game. But once again, as I said at the top of the show, <laughs> this game is not good. And I don't know. Mm. Let me set this up before we get into kind of your counters. Like, I, I, want, I want to broadly... Paint me the picture. I was going to say, I want to broadly explain why I think this game is bad. Give me the and it strokes. is just simply... This is Pokemon by the numbers to me, this game. Mm. Like, there is nothing unique or original that I feel like this game tries to do whatsoever. It very much comes across as the first Pokemon game. Like, like its main selling point was just, we're on DS now, and there's new Pokemon. And that's, like, kind of it. Um, it is crazy to me how little of interest this game. Like, there is just... Especially because we played the remakes, too. And I think... On the DS game, you know, like the Poketch or Pokeatch or whatever, the, the Poke Watch. I've always called like it with Poke the different... Tech, but I heard someone call it a Poke, poke Etch in a video. I'm like, oh, maybe I've yeah. said it wrong my whole life. Well, it's supposed to be a watch, so it can't be Tech. Oh. And it's E T C H. So I think it's Pokeatch. Etch. Poketch. Okay. Poketch. So, um, oh, that is like infinitely on the D- better on the DS where you can actually touch it and it's out of the way. <laughs> Yeah, on the DS, it, like, serves an actual function for that to be there. And again, none of those apps in it are, like, anything revolutionary. But still, like, that comes across as a little bit more novel and unique. And the remakes, you can just, like, you and I both hit it. It's like, nope, get this out of here. Uh, Uh, I hit it until the end game. (laughs) Yes. There's some useful stuff. (laughs) So, like, but yeah, I I just think the, the... There is nothing interesting about these games whatsoever i think the story is super bland on all fronts i think Mm. that in the end i think team galactic is one of the most boring factions that doesn't really have a clear goal and it doesn't feel like interesting i think the through line of becoming a champion is so boring it's just typical oh get a pokemon and go out and you have a rival it's just they, they don't do anything interesting and with that compared to previous games you know like we mentioned a lot like silver and gold where it's like your rival is a criminal <laughs> <laughs> like like different your, things like your that. rival in this game just has add <laughs> yeah basically uh which is a change of pace from one of your rivals in the last game being like a sickly boy <laughs> so definitely a huge difference um but just it just it seems like uh, on all fronts there is nothing remarkable about this game whatsoever and that is in tandem with the fact that we could talk about this too in a bit i think the decks in this game is straight up terrible (laughs) it's very bad and i and you kind of talked about that with me earlier about how there are some like glaring holes in this pokey decks which are very bizarre it's it's Um, weird yeah it's a weird decks um okay let's bring it back i was gonna say where do you want to start like i I kind of want to start with the broad brush strokes right just the lack of uniqueness i suppose one of my first notes i wrote down (laughs) this is low-key a remake of gen (laughs) one certainly the template for the beginning here so yeah it really is they just try to play the hits once again and so as an adult a nearly 30 year old man who's playing all the pokemon games in very close proximity for most of these for the first time this is so obvious to me it's like oh Eh." (laughs) but as that 13 year old who hadn't played pokemon and you know yeah it was ripped out of his hands this is i didn't know what i had missed in the intervening years this was like the great comeback so i'm very aware of that dichotomy within myself of just these different perspectives but it is the it's not just the skeleton of one it's it's got some of the meat on it still and they kind of just patch some new things there so that is it makes me wonder why they would have done it and three sapphire and ruby were so 
I don't want to say starkly different because similar. I guess the most unique well, part the, of it was the geography and yeah, the, dual, yeah. the dual villain thing. Yeah, well, the, I was going to say the geography of that. That was what was so jarring coming back to this for me is like a lot of people, you know, bash on Sapphire and Ruby for the oh too much water and stuff like that. And I mean, that is like is a problem. There, that is a, like a legitimate gripe to have with the game, but it does stand out as greatly unique within the context of the larger Pokemon series that like the whole like mm-hmm. eastern side of that map is dedicated to some sort of water exploration. This game, I, by comparison, has nothing that is unique in that mm, regard. Really. No, I'm I'm going to I want to push a little bit. I Were you going to bring up like the swamps and stuff like that? No, no. I think having the region divided by Mount Coronet is pretty cool in the way that there are yeah. re- there are differences on each side of the mountain for types. Shellos is probably the most like obvious example. Like which which side of the uh, mountain are you on? Yeah, to get different Shellos. And I uh, I really I love Snow Point City. I love that that vertic. I love the verticality kind of stretch here in it. In the that the is division. a good, uh, that is one of the best parts of the game is mm-hmm. getting to that area and making your way towards Snow Point City. It's really great. And I think the I do think probably the most unique and interesting bit about Sinnoh is it's heavily emphasized as like the origin point of the world. And they lean into that with Dialga being time and Palkia being space and all this stuff. But there's like the origin of Pokemon and the mystery of that. And that's even more prevalent now with Legends Arceus being out and, you know, it being essentially the the centuries prequel to Sinnoh. There is, this world is surrounded in a lore. Um, what's that town called? Coronet Town? With the, yeah, with the Cynthia's one, the grandmother. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I think that, I find that more interesting. It's more of a, a global lore instead of just a legendary lore of, here's a cave painting of Kyogre and Groudon fighting. It's more like, here's how our world came together and how the Pokemon came to be. And everyone is talking about it at some point of like... I disagree on that front. Like, I, I think th- I think this game's storytelling in terms of its world and how it ties into the legendaries is very, very sparse. Um, I think previous games... I'm not games, talking like specifically about Dialga and Palkia. I'm talking just... the. I think the lakes and just it feels like there's history here and i i was and i was looking asking myself you know is this history because i'm nostalgic for this game or is there or because i played rcs earlier mm-hmm. um whenever that came out and, and that's really cool actually you know when you play rcs you see these callbacks to certain characters and places like the town the main town in rcs is juby life you know, and then mm-hmm. that's where it builds up from. So that, that you know, that's just cool on the front. But I really do think, like, there's this... Everyone just seems to be asking questions about where things came from and how they came to be and was it always like this and how do Pokemon interact with the world and, like, why why is the world the way it is? And in in that way of Pokemon, it's not, like, this deep, profound storytelling. People are asking. Like, I did the... The Heatran stuff uh, in the post game this time around, and like, uh, is it Brock or whatever? The kid takes the stone and it's like causing earthquakes and stuff, and they put it back. And there's this this lore surrounding the volcano and how it it doesn't erupt, and they keep the peace with the environment and the Pokemon and stuff. I, it's cool that they were tackling the origin, and I'm a sucker for prequel storytelling, as anyone who knows me knows. So. I'm certainly more biased toward that than something else where, you know, here's a giant fish who made it rain. <laughs> I th- oh, I like the giant fish that makes it rain. Um, <laughs> I think that's my problem with this game, though, is that I do agree that a lot of those themes and ideas are cool. And I just don't think they are taken to their furthest extent and I don't think they are leaned into as much as they could be. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of it is sort of backloaded to the final town or two that you get to and then leading up to the eventual 
confrontation on top of the mountain with Dialga and Team Plasma. Like a lot of it is very heavily funneled into the final moments of the sort of overarching th- that arc within the game's story. I noticed that this time around. Galact- Team Galactic is is like not really present in most of the game. And they don't really clearly state their vision beyond just sort of being like, we're we here make to make a new world. Yeah, we just we're here to make a new world. And what does that look like? I don't know. We're in this Valley Windworks, though, and we're going to scare away the balloon out front. Like <laughs> they don't really like every other group's goals were kind of stated more clearly from the outset, I felt like. With, I, well, team, with Team Magma and Team Aqua, I felt like it was a little bit more clearly defined. Team Rocket's just bad guys kidnapping Pokemon, which is <laughs> yeah, a, but team, much more team straightforward. Team Magma was like, we're going to make more land, and that'll be good for Pokemon. And then <laughs> Team Aqua's, we're going to make more water, and it's good for Pokemon. Like, I'm not saying it's is... <laughs> ingenious, but I'm just saying <laughs> this it's... This guy was, uh, I make a new world, and it'll be better for people, which I thought that is actually a distinction. He wasn't doing it for the Pokemon. But that's the he, thing. He takes a bit to even show up. Like, you start running across oh, the yeah, Team yeah. Galactic people early, and you're like, who the heck even are these people? Like, they don't mm-hmm. really... They just kind of, like, appear out of nowhere. And it's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. who are... What's going on here? Like, they, they, there's really no sort of introduction to them and who they are, and no one in the world really contextualizes, like, oh, yeah, there's this group that's been run running around, and this is their aim. They just kind of show up and you're fighting them mm-hmm. and i i think that i think those that's what i'm saying like the the ideas of this story i think could have been much better than what was actually put into the game um i think they could have just been flesh fleshed out better i think there's a, yeah. like a, a really interesting core here and i think the the team galactic like arc whatever however you would describe that how well, there's always like three arc arcs is... in the, or there's always yeah, like yeah. two or three arcs in Pokemon game, or there's but, there's the legendary arc, there's the the the, the villain, evil group arc, the arc, and then there's the champion, champion arc. Yeah. yeah, and so with this, I really think the galactic arc pick the only pickup in it is when they start terrorizing the three lakes, and you got to go to each of them, and when they blow up, like they actually blow up the lake, they have an actual act of terrorism. They succeed yeah. in some way. I think that's actually pretty neat. It's it's a glimpse of the potential that could have been there. And, you know, oh, what is the... See, what's the leader's name? Do you even remember? Cyrus. I Cyrus, literally thing. just looked this up. Because okay, <laughs> I was you. like, I'm not going to think of his name here. So Cyrus, you know, he's like, he took the three, um, the lake legendaries, and like made a... Tortured them, made a... Like there's a really kind of evil... Team Rocket bad to Pokemon kind of energy, but with a more destructive Team Magma Aqua kind of angle to it. But it's all rushed and condensed into that. Do three lakes and then go to the top of the mountain. I think that part's really good, but the rest of Team Galactic is kind of... Which is a bummer, because I remember them being really dope. And clearly, that was just 13-year-old Max thinking it was dope. But I wish they could have maybe had a bit more of a build up, a bit more of an active role. Yeah. I liked them actually impacting the environment. Wish there was a little bit more of that. So, this is a potential. But I will say, you know, we just did Ultra Sun Ultra Moon and that team Rainbow Rocket stuff. Having Cyrus show up there and be like I succeeded is this my new world. Like that was kind of that's a great moment. And yeah, that's yeah. really cool uh, to see that come to fruition. I do remember in Platinum, they like go into a portal into like this dark realm with Giratina and stuff. So they, I, maybe it's a bit more, it, maybe it's a bit better in Platinum. And it's interesting what they did and didn't include from Platinum in these remakes, which is a bit, yeah, it's interesting. I never played Platinum. I'll, I'll give these games, um, like, yeah, I, I do like that they, Incorporate uh, Uxy, Mesprit, and Zelf. Yeah. The three, the three lake Pokemon. I like that they're kind of incorporated into the. I, I, I like those interconnecting elements that like there's the three lake. Uh, what are mm-hmm. they called? Guardians or whatever the heck. Spirits, yeah. The dogs. Whatever. The the birds. 
Well, I was just going to say, I like that they're in corp- they're tied in with the larger legendaries, which are Dialga and Palkia, and they have, mm-hmm. like, there's, like, a sort of interconnectivity between Every, all of them. All of them feel like they have, even Heatran, you throw Heatran or Darkrai or Celestia, Shaman, and Arceus. There's all some Cresselia. sort of- Cresselia. Cresselia, thank you. There's all some sort of, like, guardian, ancient angle to them, right? Darkrai with nightmares, Shaman with- grass fields bringing people together Arceus is literally a god Pokemon I was gonna say they get they go, they go kind of crazy in this game they're like mm-hmm. a space one that controls space and time one that controls mm-hmm. the ground and the, the, the earth Lava itself and stuff they definitely it, kind of primal the, origin yes of earth which all feeds into Sinnoh being the start of yes. Pokemon world things those are types of storytelling elements that I love but I do get that it's well, uh, I mean, yeah. to kind of maybe, well, I don't know if there's anything else we want to say about story. We can come back to it in a second. But I did want to mention the Pokédex and how we talked about it wasn't that good. That is the one thing that I think this Pokédex does very well is the legendaries. Um, mm-hmm. The legendaries in this game are expansive. There is a lot of cool ones, a lot of very different, unique ones. Um, cool typings to some of them, too. Like Giratina being a ghost dragon is awesome. I really like that. Um I wish like it it sucks with the remakes again. We've talked about the remakes and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about what we yeah, think I do want to damn. Um, it sucks that you cannot get dark Ray and Shaman to my knowledge in these, or did they do events for them? So just... they did do an event last year. Suck. Uh, of course. So, okay. But no, 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 no. That was the big thing when I saw that direct and was like, we have this event, but, and I looked it up, but you had to beat the game and I was like, well, I'm not going to beat it in time for yeah. these events. So it sucks. I missed getting you know the special card and doing the shaman thing and so while i can't do the events in the game you still can get those pokemon okay cool in arceus ah. <laughs> so if you have a brilliant diamond or shining pearl save data in the end the game in the post game of arceus you can do missions that let you catch both of okay. them which i did do because i've always wanted legitimate dark Rye and shaman yeah and i yeah. was able to do Me that too. so um totally still accessible uh you just have to play <laughs> another game which That's is fine i'll, I'll yeah, probably do that yeah you'll play it eventually anyway. so you can still get them good and i've caught them fairly easy they're level 70 each of them so um it was i i actually it was very important to me it felt like to make sure i did that it felt like a rite of passage for my 13 year old self to at least <sighs> interact with them in in the game in some way instead of hacking through a I was gonna say well if you're like me you used to like look that stuff up on the internet and like Mm -hmm. see people like capture themselves doing it and you're like is this real can I do this (laughs) in my game like I would watch people and how they would catch RCS and I'd be like that's wait where do you get this flute what the uh-huh. heck and then I'm like trying to figure out I remember out how to get like this flute. hotel card like there's that one locked hotel in um the the port town off to yeah and it's like, how do you get in there? <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so cool as a kid. Um, it, the lore is good. To just yeah, I mean, to kind of tie off some of the story stuff we talked about. Um, again, that's my main complaint is I just would have liked more out of this. I I think there is missed opportunity. Everything that is in this game regarding its story, I I will say I do not think is like outright bad by any means. It is just very kind of. It's straightforward in the sense that, you know, there's an evil group. They want the legendary Pokemon. What do they want to do with it? They want to get it for themselves so they can create a new world Mm. and blah, blah, blah. Like, there's really no deviation from past games in that sense. Um, Specifically, you know, like Sapphire Ruby, there's a lot of commonality between the goals of Team Galactic and Team Magma and Aqua just as far as we want the legendary so we can control things. The world, and, yeah. Change the yeah. world in some way. So, like, in that sense, I, I think just their motives and goals are very uninteresting and boring, and I think Galactic fails to stand out. Um, but like you said, like, some of the deeper themes and ideas of space and time and origin points, that stuff I think is cool, and I just would have liked to have seen it included a little bit. Mm-hmm. more like even like i think about like kind of the beginnings of the game like why wasn't like 
like like just sprinkling it in a little bit more because i don't remember these things being sprinkled in throughout the game like when rowan gives you the pokedex you could say something like you're about to explore sino which is the origin point for i want the, i want to world. know about the mysteries of evolution <laughs> yeah yeah like that's like the <laughs> yes I, I i don't know can we it's, just that's what x and y does Oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what X and Y is. I thought you were referring to that. That's literally no, Professor Rowan is the professor of evolution. He wants to know the stuff. The, the impetus of in X and Y is to we need to figure out what me mega evolutions are all about. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> oh my gosh. So like that's I think they could have like tied it in a little bit more to like the Rowan yeah. stuff and the stuff with Dawn or what is the character? So you played as Dawn, they're the I girl character actually. Uh, what is the male character's name? If you, because I've never done that, honestly. Lu Lucas. Okay. I think so. it's Lucas. Okay. Um. Yeah, like I feel like they could have tied that in a little bit more. Rowan in this game is just sort of like there. <laughs> yeah, really it's Lucas. <laughs> Yeah, it's Don and Lucas. Um, I don't know. There was there. There's a way to interconnect these different story beats a little bit more than I think they did. Um, it feels very sort of incoherent as a result. Um, Segmented for sure. Yeah, I don't know how you felt about like the gym and champion three line stuff in that front. Again, I don't feel like it's anything super unique. Um, like, I, I don't know. Like, Cynthia is obviously a character people love at the end of the game and is considered one of the best champions yeah. ever. It's great music. She's, I think she's one of the best that we've, I certainly like her more than Steven, certainly from a battle perspective. You know, her showing up, just kind of specifically, she kind of shows up throughout your adventure like most champions. And it's like, oh, go check this out for me, or here, go do this, or give Psyducks some, some medicine. I was going to say, here's some medicine for some Psyducks. <laughs> go visit my grandma you know so it's it's <laughs> but you know it's a little interesting she's not as engaged i think narratively as i personally would like a champion to be yes but i think her design is cool you know the all black the hair loopies the whole deal i think she's she's visually pretty cool and she you know it's pretty obvious it's like oh i'm i'm the champion just walking mm -hmm. around helping out it's cool there, but you know, wish she could have maybe done more. It, it feels more like that segmenting. I think well, these. I was yeah. just gonna say these older Pokemon games always felt like they tried to surprise you at the end, like with who the champion was. Like surprise, <laughs> surprise! I'm Steven, and I was the champion all along, and I never told you. And then they do the same thing here in this game with Cynthia. I think if they could just kind of like come out with that <laughs> a little bit earlier in the story like well i think like that was more... one of the things we really loved about sword and shield was we knew who the champion was the yeah and then you're kind of like champion you're kind of like building to that over the course of the game mm -hmm. um they even do it in a cool way with uh like i think of back to silver and gold like you lance is like pretty present throughout that game and so when you get to fight him towards the end it's like this is a You've seen Lance in battle, and you know he's very strong, except he's kind of easy to beat because he's only got dragon type Pokemon. <laughs> just ice him all to death. Ice, ice, um, ice, baby. But, like, you get to see his power, like, on full display, and you, like, there's a couple different games where they do that. And otherwise, like, with Steven and Cynthia, they're just these kind of, like, shadowy characters that you don't really know about and then they sort of surprise you at the end where it's like i'm actually mega powerful i got a guard chop fight <laughs> me she could have been in it a little bit more and i think they could have had some better scenes with her in it for sure um but that yeah. doesn't take away from her final fight or anything like that necessarily yeah that's the interesting thing about the champion is like they could have very little presence in the game but if the battle is good then it's a you know they yeah get, they get like a pass which is interesting mm -hmm. I do uh, the rival. I wanted to kind of touch on the rival a little bit. He is better than, uh, oh my gosh, what's the kid's name? Will oh, Wally. Wally. I was gonna say Willie. The one in the like, last game. Right. What? He's better than Wally. Wally and May features the boy character. Yes, in the previous game. But he's not like. He's terrible, dude. He's pretty rough. <laughs> He's really he's like, rough. He 
he's the typical, like, I'm going to be the best. How do you keep beating me? He's so one note. Yeah, it's a it's a real bummer. There's like no character development uh, that's interesting, like throughout the course of the game with him whatsoever. I do like, like, like I like even the... Wally. Even, I would even say I know you hated Wally, but I would even say there's like Wally far has an character. arc. Yeah, Wally, yeah, Wally has, an, has arc. an arc and like actual character development. And oh yeah, your, your rival in this game, which I named uh, Ugly Max. Was my Thank you for that, name. by the way. <laughs> he, uh, I do like the physical comedy of him, which I think is kind of hard to do in a 2D game and pseudo 3D. He mm -hmm. he is very comedic, always running and bumping into people and always shouting that you owe him a million. Fine, he's gonna find you a million dollars. Oh, I thought like, that was cringe. I think it's cute <laughs> in a in a like a goofy kid way, right? He's like a kid, yeah, yeah. I mean. Like I think that's fun. I also really maybe it's just because of where we've been we just came off ultra sun but i really respect them not making him the final fight like after Cynthia, oh, yeah. like oh he sh yo he he just won doing the red and blue thing of like uh he just won so now he's the champion um i really respect that they make you fight right before you go to the elite four you can heal up and then you just do the elite four in cynthia like that mm -hmm. actually feels really good and the right way to handle that and then in the post game you run into him around the battle tower and on um, mount stark so it's cool th that they at least know his place <laughs> you know they don't elevate him to utmost importance yes i i think um <laughs> I just don't have i just don't have much else to say about him to be honest like he's very the version of that character that you see in the opening minutes of the game is kind of the same version that you're seeing by the conclusion. And mm -hmm. he also has a really soft team, I have to say. Like one of the softer yeah, ones. Yeah, he's... And it takes him a long time to bring them, like, fully up. Yes. Like, fully yes. evolve them. It's like, he keeps going, like, how do I keep losing him? Like, maybe because your team sucks. Like, Wally actually had some kind of, like, interesting Pokemon on his team that I remember. Gary, or whatever, Blue, always had, like pretty cool unique team in those games i felt like uh, mm -hmm. yeah that's not that is not true here in this game with your rival what is his name it's just whatever you name him i guess yeah i called uh, him I'm not sure if, i'm not sure if there's a canon name for him. there's probably a canon name from the show there surely is <laughs> barry his name is barry barry <laughs> cue the jazz music i'm not sure if you wanted to talk uh, any further uh, about the Pokédex itself. I figured we could maybe do that since we've already kind of touched on it a bit. Yeah. So this is part of my Pokédex troubles, I think. Because when I came to this game at 13, I had no idea what was new or what was old, or, you know, Gen 2 or Gen 3. It was all new to me. So this Dex in my brain is, is warped where yes. certain ones of these Pokémon's really were from uh ruby and sapphire or i mean you probably saw stuff like silver. crobat and steelix and you're like whoa what's that <laughs> like okay, i knew what a steelix was but <laughs> like you hadn't even been exposed to those things technically right. in yeah any of the games. so so my brain really struggles with like separating them because to me they're they're all if they weren't red and blue pokemon which i did know they were all diamond pearl pokemon so I do, but looking at this list, building the team, the 151, like, ee, not like a strong group here. And we've talked about this huge lack of fire. Like, where's yes. the fire? This is not cool. There's literally, if you do not choose Infernape as your starter, <laughs> then your options are Rapidash or Ponyta. And then what I did for this game, if I if I because I wanted a fire type, but I didn't want to choose Infernape because I usually choose Infernape, I ended up using a Skun Tank <laughs> because it learns Flamethrower. Like there is just like there are huge, just glaring holes in this Pokédex. Once again, like there are no electric types outside of like there's Luxray and that's it. And then there's like Pika and then there's Pikachu and that's it. So, <laughs> so that's the the core 151. But yes. then they do the thing to get the national decks. You have to see all 151. Now, I don't know if that was a thing in 
Ruby and Sapphire. I don't like the originals because I think it Omega was. and Alpha. That I can't remember. I'm assuming that was the case. And if so, mm-hmm. credit where it's due, and that's cool. But since I was doing post game stuff here in Brilliant Diamond to build my team, I had to run around and see everything. And this kind of sparked this really. I thought this was really cool, actually. To, this, you you probably felt the same way I felt with Sun and Moon because I did a lot of post game stuff in those games, and I was like, I'm feeling like very compelled to capture things in this game that I haven't. So in previous games we played, yeah. And so the fire under me was I wanted a Skarmory, which is on Route 227, and I, I you need the national decks to get there. And so I went through and looked at everything I was missing, compiled a list, and then I loaded up Arceus went and caught them because it's easier to just go catch them in that game how and sad then, is that <laughs> well it's like some of well, them are not... just like hidden or yeah you can you... just you can see what you're catching in yes RCS that's and the Scarlet easy and part. And, yeah and so then i imported them all over through pokemon home filled my decks up even brought like palkia over from Arceus, so like i saw everything so i could get the whole decks and but then unlocking it and then having I feel like at least this is where my brain taps out too. Like how the 490 Pokemon, like there we go. That's all the Pokemon I need. I don't need a thousand. That seems like too much, but it's cool to have. It felt cool to me in this moment to have like the national decks and it actually be everyone from. So you did fill like full complete national decks in this game. Not a national decks. That's the, the regional one, the Sinnoh decks to get the national decks. Mm hmm. So I haven't checked the numbers, but I'm I'm okay in the two between two and three hundred. I'd have to imagine because I've okay I had to catch a lot and do a lot. So yeah, uh, but I was really having fun like seeing everything in the game. And when you get into the post game, everything on that island in that big circle with Mount Stark and stuff, you start seeing the diversity goes way up. And I also mm-hmm. noticed it in the Grand Underground as well. The diversity spikes and you're seeing pokemon from all over and i think that was that was really cool to me this time around considering that we've played all the other games up to this point so like i really was recognizing every i felt actually like i had some pokemon knowledge for the first time really this season and and that was cool so i do think this is probably just a more broad pokemon thing but when when you know the decks and when they bring back the old Pokemon in the right way, it is very satisfying to see them and interact with them and catch them and battle them. And while the Sinnoh Dex is pretty weak, pretty weak, I think the payoff of having to fill that, see that weak Dex to get everyone, and that's where all the cool legendary, you know, the extra legendaries we were talking about are hiding and just you can get everyone. And they, even bring in, you know, if you have a Deoxys, there's those stones and and is it Velastone? You can. I didn't know the, you could do anything with a Deoxys in this game. To be honest, there are four stones over on the right hand oh, side and it of changes, Velastone. Like it Attack changes form, Deoxys, defense yep. form, speed okay. form, and yep. normal. So I remember thinking that was really cool as a kid. Yeah. So you know, there's. Uh, the I never Rodon, had a Deoxys. You could change. So I never- so you can change well i i hacked a deoxys in so i was yeah. able to like do all that stuff so there's the world kind of fleshes out once you get the national decks and i think that was a way they made it feel bigger and that was pretty cool um but yeah main decks week <laughs> main decks is i mean the thing i want to say about the main decks is just there is a huge lack of we mentioned variety but just some of the typings are straight up terrible too. Like, so you and I did our Pokemon battle earlier. Um, and I was talking to you about like how Empoleon has got to be the worst starter Pokemon in the history of Pokemon because it's literally weak to both of the other starter types <laughs> in this game. Like Infernape can it's defeat it because form, it's yeah. a fight. Yeah. Infernape can, because it has that steel typing, it then becomes weak against Infernape because it's a fighting type, and then it's by default weak to um, Torterra or Turtwig or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, Empoleon is such a wash in this game, which me- then means there aren't any other water types, to be honest, in this game either. 
Um, like there's the shellos, which is evolves into gastrodon, and then you have um, oh, there's one other I'm I'm trying to think of. I'm, I'm scanning the decks here. Well, they add like they add a couple like new baby forms in this game too, like Azurol, Mime Junior, mm. um, stuff like that. Oh, Finion, yeah. it, Finion was the one I was thinking of that they add as well. Um, then, they also add Mantike is another baby type they add. Which they kind of got that baby team. kick again because they did it a little bit in Johto with yes. gold and silver. There's a baby kick there, and there's a baby kick in this game. Yeah, you know, Munchlax the... was introduced in this game as well. I think was I think Clefo was introduced in this game, but I honestly can't I think so. And Happening, Happening right? was as well. Um, Bonsley so. was as well for Sudowoodo. Uh-huh. Um, so there's a lot of babies in this Big game. baby energy. And well, the, the other thing I want to say too is that they then go back and expand. This is the one like saving grace of this decks, I think, is the expansions on Pokemon that never evolved previously. I think all of the ones that they choose to evolve are very cool. Um, like Apom all evolving into Ambipom is cool. Um, I'm not saying that... The evolve for I don't think Ambipom is that great of a design Pokemon. <laughs> it just goes from one monkey with a hand tail to a monkey with two hand tails. But still, that's one. They've got Miss Magius. They've got Honchkrow. Mm. Uh, and then I think about the ones later on for uh, like Magmortar and Electri- Electrovire. And, yes, I remember uh, thinking they Rip- were really, really cool. Rhyperion, I think, or Rhyperior. Um, oh, yeah, the big beefy boy. Yeah, so all the ones from the previous games that end up getting forms are Weavile, Magnezone, Lickalicky, uh, Rhyperior, uh, Tangrowth, Electrovire, Magmortar, Togekiss was introduced in this po- in this mm. Pokédex as well, uh, Yanmega, which is the evolved form of Yanma, and then uh, there is also, uh, they added the new Eevees evolutions in this too with uh, Leafeon and... Leafeon and Glaceon. Oh, and then they added Mamoswine, uh, they added Glysaur, which is the evolved form of Gligor, Gligar. Uh, they then have Porygon Z, uh, Probopask, yeah. Dusk Noir. Like, there's a lot of cool ones that they give new evolved forms of from previous games. And I really like their new forms. And see that you're saying all of this, and it's all coming to me, but all of those post-game. are post game. Yep. Which is so. I'm hesitant to just say outright bad. But it does add, it does add like a post game incentive of like all the new Pokemon are almost locked behind the end game, which is not normal. If, are all of them like, like most of those, and Glaceon even locked? Um, no, because you have to go to like a stone in Snowpoint, and I want to say the yeah. forest to like transform them like in, like in por- those locations. Porygon, I don't think, or no, well, a lot of these, here's the thing with a lot of these is they're all tied to the national decks. I, well, yeah. I was going to say they're all tied to specific items that you have to obtain. Yeah, uh, the like, Hi- like Hyperior. Yeah, like the the Hyperior, I know you need like the, it's like some like armor um, mm-hmm. item. I know for Electrovire, you need the Electra. Ma- Magmortar, you need a specific item. The Pokemon themselves, items aside, are all based off previous designs that would have been in the national decks. Yeah. So it's it's weird that, interesting at the very least, that it's all post game, which kind of adds decks chasing excitement, I guess, to mm-hmm. that post game. But it does make the front half of the game, the core, not as thrilling from a team building perspective. Like I, I was dragging this Luxray around the whole game because I didn't, did not want it, but I needed someone on my team, and it was just. I love Luxray personally. It's one of my. Fa- I just didn't want it because I've used it previously. Yeah, and I didn't want it on my team. This like time. if I if I could have got, like yeah, that that's what I guess is strange to me. Like something cool like Electrovire is awesome. I would have absolutely had an Electrovire this game if I could have, you know caught an Elekid or an Electrobuzz like earlier in the game and like evolved mm-hmm. like that's or even Magnezone like these things are just you can't really get them early on in mm-hmm. the game um, and it stinks yeah the core decks itself that like you're able to get as you are doing the gym runs pretty yeah. weak for the most part there is some like I don't want to I don't want to totally discount the entire decks I think for me this time so because I have played this game two or three times in the past 
I have used a lot of the Pokemon that I have liked um, previously. Like for instance, I mentioned like that I didn't choose Infernape this time. It's because I normally choose him. I've done runs with Torterra as well. I chose Empoleon just because I normally don't choose Empoleon. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of good Pokemon in this deck. I really like Hippodon. I really like Drapion. I think that's a really cool Pokemon. I like the two poison types they have in this game. Uh, Drapion and Toxicroak, I think, are both pretty cool. Yeah, Toxicroak's uh, cool. Lucario's great. Uh, Garchomp is obviously awesome. Sorry, I know you're going to say something. No, I was Lucario. just... Lucario was kind of the the face of this yeah. game, to a, especially in the anime and Super yes. Smash Bros. Brawl, replacing yes. Mewtwo. Like, Lucario yeah. has become... I mean, he was then and it has remained like an icon within the the series. I actually, it just hit me. Lucario Mega Evolution's kind of a beat in X and Y, right? Like getting the Lucario and Mega evolving it. Mm, I think that's perhaps. a beat in the game. I can't remember, to be honest with you. Lucario is big and it, it came from yeah. here. And, yes. And that's a part of the game I totally skipped. I never went to the Iron Island this time around. I just didn't hop on yeah, the Yeah, you boat. can totally pass it up, yeah. And there's the Haunted Mansion you can skip. And um, so there are like different. There are more there, things. Like there's like a I know I mentioned in Solisian Town or something with a bunch of unknowns in it. And there's like a whole mystery there. So yeah, there's, there's definitely more to. I, I didn't give this game enough credit. Like the, the more we talk here, the more we think about it. There is a lot more to do off the beaten path. I know I've said earlier in the episode that there wasn't a whole lot to the post game or a whole lot to do. It, it probably just doesn't seem like a whole lot in my mind because I played these games for countless hours. So they seem mm -hmm. almost like smaller in my head, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, because I would just pour massive chunks of time. But yeah, the core decks, like I think even like the fossil types are pretty cool in this decks as well, even though they are incredibly, incredibly weak types, I think. Um, just, I don't know. I, I, I struggle with rock types sometimes because they're so susceptible. Uh, Vespa Queen, we both had on our teams this time. I think that's a cool Pokemon. Yeah, um, she's dope. Drifloon was another one uh, that is a very unique um, I, I, you thought I, you probably thought I, I was going to use that. I thought you, I thought you had one of those and an Infernape. So, so I, I, and, I, and I figured you'd have a Garchomp just because you're a dragon lover. So that's kind of what I thought. Those three. I did have a Drift Blim for a large chunk of this game, but I did not end up carrying it through to the end. I just kind of like fell out of love with it the more I played. Okay. Um, and also, I imported it from Sword and Shield. <laughs> Because yeah. you can just go catch one that one. I was like, oh, the power of Pokemon Home. Let's go do this instead. Um, and then I don't know if I mentioned it before, but like Spiritomb is really awesome. Like it's, oh, it's yeah. a really cool Pokemon just because it straight up doesn't have weaknesses until they freaking ruin it later with fairy typing. Fairy typing. I, I struggle with it in this game. Because it's a it's, remake, right? It, it's not designed with fairy type in mind, sort of. Yes, like, and it that really frustrated me at a couple of encounters and just yes, like, I was like, this isn't this Dex wasn't designed, but but they are also trying to maintain compatibility forward. So like, I get the struggle, but I was a little bit perturbed that fairy was in this game and i if you had if you brought a fairy type on your team would have been i was actually oh, you have been you would a little cracked. worried yeah it would like it's, it's, <laughs> you would have very cracked honestly it's, so it's especially when fighting cynthia like yeah it's just so i was i was a bit bummed that it was there it felt imbalanced i, I while we're talking about this like this game's merits as a remake. I know we were going to bring this up as well. I don't think this is a, I don't think this is a great remake. I, I just think there's, it's, well, here's the other thing. Let me, let me start here. Like we talked about how like fairy typing being included is just kind of ruins things to a large degree. You know what else wasn't included in the original games was like the full team EXP share, which mm -hmm. I feel like throws off. This game has weird, I, like to me difficulty well sure i know i'm sure you like it and stuff like that but it has strange like difficulty swings as a result like i feel like the game's balance was hard for like in some sense i i i think the game was very easy but then like you get to the end game with the elite four and all of a sudden like the difficulty kind of ratchets up out of nowhere 
which is fine. Like I want it to be a challenge. Maybe you didn't have as much of a challenge as I did because my team was incredibly weak to certain things. <laughs> like I, I, had, I didn't I, really struggle through the Elite Four or with Cynthia. But yeah, I team, think you probably had a better design team for it. Again, my team had yeah. some glaring holes. Um, so maybe that was just a me thing. But um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I felt like the full team EXP uh, didn't really keep things completely balanced because there was like gym leaders i would get to where i felt like all my pokemon were eight to ten levels ahead of their own and then i'm getting later in the game and cynthia has pokemon that are higher level than mine i i don't know it was just kind of felt like i was all over the place but i don't know if that's attributed to how i built my team um at which stages in the game i got my team how i imported my pokemon because obviously if i'm importing i'm getting like exp boosts on certain pokemon and things like that you know so yeah. i don't know like i don't know if you felt that as well no i felt fairly as far as difficulty in that sort of pacing um felt fine to me and obviously being an adult and just having all my pokemon share experience just tremendously helps the pace of the game and my ability to stay engaged on a higher level instead of like having to grind out you know got to bring this one pokemon up so it's close to everyone else so that's just a modern convenience i will say I th this might be a, fa a good segue but um i thought the encounter rate for the wild pokemon was a bit steep um you take like a step fight oh yeah and then another step and you'd fight again the wild i like i was I was getting pretty sick of it. And then repels are your friend. Hmm? If you're not, if there's, I said repels are your friend. If you're going yeah. through patches of grass that you know you don't want to catch any Pokemon that are in those patches, repel away. Oh, I was repelling quite a bit that, toward the that's end. How, that's how I've been playing all of these games. But I think the other thing is, is the modern era of Pokemon has ruined me from Sword and Shield's wild areas to just Scarlet and Violet and Arceus just being the Pokemon are out. Like, seeing the encounter and engaging willingly or being caught off guard a little bit and getting, you know, one charges you and you're stuck is just the way Pokemon should be. Yeah. And in the upper half of Diamond and Pearl, that is not the case. It's old school and the random encounters are too high. But the Grand Underground has those types of encounters in yes. this game. And I think that was way more fun from a hunt Pokemon and catch them perspective. And I really, I thought maybe to segue to the Grand Underground, I remember as a kid, the Underground was really cool having the secret base. I'm aware I, that was in Scarlet and Ruby, right? Building a base. So while it was new to me i realized it wasn't necessarily new to the franchise but i do think this grand underground here in brilliant diamond and shining pearl with these zones where you can see the pokemon and catch them and it basically be this kind of dreamy world where just all these generations are mishmashed together especially in the end game like if i was a if i was 13 year old max playing diamond and pearl today I totally would see myself getting lost down there running and catching and trying to, you know, get certain Pokemon and building up my base. Like, cause I got hooked on the base building and you add all this seeing the Pokemon in an environment, I think is really neat. And so I think the grand underground was actually pretty cool in this game. I did not spend a lot of time with it. I definitely did back in the original, not enough to ever get a, Spiritum, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I I did definitely commit some time to it back in the day, and I think the new expansive areas where there are actual Pokemon running around that you can catch is a really cool addition to this game that I appreciated. Um, it's it's like the biggest bit. deviation from the original. Yeah, and I uh, I appreciated it because it circumvented some of the odd ways that you have to get certain pokemon like i mentioned you asked me if i we both had vespa queens on our team and you mentioned if i um if i got my combi by slathering honey on a tree and i was like no i went to the underground and i caught one down there which is great i'm glad i had that option because lord knows i did not want to wait 
for the honey to activate on the trees after the time passed or whatever. I did do it. I did do it on the tree. But I just, just saved, saved before. I just and saved could, and waited you know, until I got the one I wanted. So I mean, that's that's the way to do it. But that would also take a hot minute, I would imagine. It, unless well, it you took got like lucky. ten minutes. Okay, that's not too bad then. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't bad at all. Um, but yeah, I think the Grand Underground was really cool. But the rest of the game, pretty rigid in adhering to the originals. Yes, which is. You know, that's always the thing between remake, remaster, and that sort of discussion there. To to me, I liked it for the most part. I think um, I, I, maybe you have stuff to say about this as well, but I'm, I have some beef with the visual design of this game. Yes. I was about to bring this up. Like, that is where <sighs> Pokemon does not have a, like, chibi sort of art style to it like it, it just i would i'd push back on that a little bit there are certain <sighs> games that do have that aesthetic maybe but i don't know like this so here's this my is, thing with it there's there's a large there's a there's a lot we could talk about here yeah go ahead chibi specifically i think in the like in the overworld when you adhere to that style across the game, I think it would have been fine. I, I, it looks like a top-down DS game in that way to a degree. I had a real issue with everyone's talking in their little chibi characters, and then you'd get in a battle, and they're correctly portioned humans. Yep, yep, yep. That's what that I That drove me nuts. That's I was what like, I hated this is, as well. Mm, no, 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 it thank was, you. It was very jarring. I mean, that's how the older Pokemon games, I guess were like short little stubby character models that you're sure. walking around the world and then they look like normal people but it's that was more that limitation was, of hardware uh, in exactly your brain. this exactly. is yep these are like little it's very much feels like they tried to do Link's awakening remake on switch sort of but for pokemon yes. v- but, but then it's not congruent it, like mm-hmm. a, and on, on all fronts like that that's totally the problem yes yes yeah my other big issue with this game, I'm wondering if you share it visually speaking. Um, I guess there are two. They took that blur, that bokeh, cranked it all the way up, and basically your character is in like one plane of focus, and then everything below and behind is just like got smeary blur all yep. over it. Yep. I think yep. that just looks really I noticed ugly. That, I noticed that in the very, like I got accustomed to it as I played, but the Your opening, brain shuts it off, yeah. The opening like hour or two was very, very jarring. And I did yeah, it's like so, it. it's so soft. And it made me, that's probably the part that made me want, wish it, we could have played the original DS versions more just because they would have looked crisp and clean and really good. I think the DS games are the best looking stretch of Pokemon, I think, because they took that GBA style, beefed it up a little bit, and then added some 3D stuff, especially. Yeah, these are having a little later. This is having me excited to play black and white, to be honest. To yes, be honest with I'm I, I'll actually And I think the sprites in that game look so good. Like playing Yeah, playing this game made me really excited for black and white. In black and white too. And well, not only that, but like as we've been recording, I've been like looking over at some of the sprites for some of the Pokemon in this Gen 2, and they have sleek designs. And just this transition to Pokemon in 3D has, I, I don't know if we've talked about this over the course of the season very much, but it's just not the same appealing. <laughs> yeah. It did it does not have the same sort of charm to it any longer, Sprite. which is fine. I've Bring accepted it. Like I'm not stuck in the past and I am. I, I kind like I I've I've accepted that we've shifted in this direction and I know why we have, but they just I feel like a lot of the Pokemon have like muted. They they just look like desaturated now, like like these old sprites pop so hard on some of these Pokemon, and they're just the same colors are not there now with some of them. And there are a lot of examples of this that you can pull up and see yeah. um like side by sides and stuff like that the other the last thing yeah you, you you described properly my issue with the chibi stuff though in this remake is is just that 
old Pokemon games, yes, they looked like that because of hardware limitations, not because that was what the developers wanted them to be. So I, I think just creating actual like character models that looked like, you know, normal people like they do in the actual battle sequences would have been the the path forward in this instance. Um See, I I imagine it's a bit of a struggle because maybe not. I re- Alpha Sapphire felt this way where it was a little like a weirdish not straight chibi but a little weird. I think yeah. I think X and Y, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon for sure, a bit more correctly portioned for the system. Yes, yeah. X and Y, you'll find it to be to answer our qualms here with what okay. we're saying. So I think this game, though, it either should have stuck Chibi all the way through, or I think the cute little Chibi Pokemon would have been an, at least an interesting art direction. I don't think that could have worked. I think it would have only extended to the human character models and they use those in the a lot of the like promotional materials for this game too is the mm-hmm. gb designed character models for the player characters or the npcs and stuff my other issue visually speaking is tied to gameplay in a way um because just like link's awakening remake this game is stuck in a eight octagonal grid of movement you snap everywhere Mm -hmm. it's snap 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 but the world is visually just a open 3d space but there's just little walls and corners everywhere and i was just getting constantly stuck and colliding like trying to walk down a path or around Mm -hmm. i'd accidentally hop over ledges all the time because if you get just a little too close you automatically will hop it just felt really sloppy there's just like a level of slop kind of just thrown over the movement in the world. Corridors were too tight, but they didn't look tight because of the visual 3D world. It's just it it's a this is a game that was previously played on a you only had four directions to move in up down left and right and now you have an actual eight. D-pad instead now, of an yes. analog stick. Now you have an analog stick so you can move in eight directions and it does not always work i felt like the you can bike... move in uh, you can move in directions circles. yeah but on the ds with the d-pad you could move in eight directions and you, just you can move in eight you corn. can move in diagonally in on the ds version i believe so okay well maybe you could do that anyway yes the previous game was designed on a grid and now it hasn't but all the environments are the same yes so it feels it's it was very <laughs> frustrating many many times I, the bike like, did not feel good in this game I ran mo- most of the time. I yeah, I, I was a bit, is a bit bummed. So, the last thing I want to say about this game's merits is a remake. Like we talked about the underground and how they added some new stuff there. Other than that, though, there is just really, like when you remake a game, you want it to keep in co- intact, like the sort of core of what the game previously was. I understand that to a degree, um, but I feel like Pokemon games are a bit different in this regard with their remakes where you want them to also add newer elements. And I feel like they have done that with, you know, uh, leaf green and fire red, where they're having, adding a whole new areas, the Sevi islands and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and heart gold and soul silver. They're adding, uh, I can't think off the top of my head of some of the stuff they added. They, they, they always add like the fact that your Pokemon can trail you behind in that game. Like it's a, it's a small like thing, but there's something unique to those remakes. Like there's always new little things that they have added in their previous remakes. And this is the most by the numbers Pokemon remake that they have ever done. There mm-hmm. is really nothing new in this game whatsoever. Besides and I the grand, think, the grand underground. I, yes, besides but, some like small stuff with the underground. This is really the most straightforward Pokemon remake I think they have ever made, and I think mm-hmm. some of that is because they outsourced it to ILCA. I would imagine that the team that remade this game or did the work on this game felt like they weren't at liberty to, you know, overhaul too many things yeah, yeah, yeah. too much or change a whole lot. They, and or that's they were probably told not to. Yeah, or, or that's why they were hired. You know, that's why they were brought in to do this. Hey, don't change too much. We just want to keep this what it was. But at the same time, that's also to me like 
it this game needed a couple other newer elements to latch on to yeah and make it stand out because i really did get to the end of this and feel like there was really no sort of reason for us to have like when we did our um a Ruby and Sapphire episode where we had Kim Hawkins on that episode with us and he played through one of the GBA games. I believe he played through Emerald and that made for an interesting discussion because there was a lot of differences between the remakes that you and I played and Mm -hmm. the version that he played on GBA and we talked about some of those things on that episode. This episode, I feel like somebody could have played this like with us and could have played the original DS games and there's really no changes whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's just uninteresting i guess would be yeah it's a bit lackluster especially in in a franchise that as you pointed out in their remakes generally add something there's something besides just a visual flair change of different graphics and new hardware but also you know up until i guess up until sword and shield yeah up until sword and shield there'd be a new iteration of the game out, you know, a year or two later. Yeah. Uh, Yellow, Crystal, uh, Emerald, Platinum Platinum. here. I guess Black and White didn't do that. They did straight sequel. And then um, X and Y didn't have one, infamously. (laughs) They skipped Z. They did skip. Well, Z was in the works, but it, it, uh, they stopped. It's a whole thing. Um, (laughs) We'll talk, we might talk about that in the next episode. But, and then Sun and Ultra Sun, and then from here on out, I think we're just getting DLC, which is the logical thing in the modern era. So it's, they always have added stuff, right? They've always enhanced, refined, Game of the Year edition affied their games, and then the remakes do a similar thing. And this one is, like you said, so by the numbers. And a part of me, that 13-year-old that wants to look back through rose-tinted glasses, is like, ah, this is nice. One of the notes I wrote was just like, I'm home, like I'm back. But from a engaging in modern gameplay perspective, it's just, we could have done a little bit more here and not adding fairy type, like adding fairy type was not the thing to do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So it's a bit of a bummer in that regard. And it makes me slightly nervous because the next one on the slate is black and white and presumably black and white too will would follow after that well unless they do like a let's go johto which they could do that's always kind of been floating since pikachu and eevee well i'll say this like i know i mentioned up uh, earlier that like these games were quote unquote panned but to be honest like these games were very they were not well received not only by critics but fans have kind of pushed back on these games as well. Fan, fans have been pushing on Pokemon since X and Y. They ha- <laughs> they have been, but but fan the Pokemon community has kind of made it known a lot of the things we've been saying here like if we're going to keep getting remakes in this series moving forward, this is not what we want or what we're expecting. And I I think those expectations have only been placed on fans because once again, as we've mentioned, all the other previous remakes they've done have largely been great. Um, I mean, Omega Omega and Alpha, the Ruby and Sapphire remakes were maybe not as great either. But I thought those games, even as somebody who had nostalgia, like we're talking about adding new things to games you're already nostalgic for. I thought those games did great with that. Like, um, Yeah, the Delta episode. And- yeah, the, I, I thought those games did, did, some, did some good things in that regard. Um, it's- and it's really not true here so moving forward with black and white if they do end up remaking those they have to put more energy in because it it, we're in a time right now like when we're recording this and i guess this will be true throughout the entire time that this you know season is releasing but like you talked about how the pokemon fan base has been pushing back a lot well like game freak and the pokemon company have like kind of brought this upon themselves like they think of Mm. the past couple years of pokemon they have released the most straightforward bland remake that they've ever done. They followed that up with releasing new gens, which were completely like broken <laughs> at launch. And honestly still kind of are to some degrees like, like, yeah, like they're not, they're not busted. Obviously you can play them, but they do not run well. They are not high quality video games um, with Scarlet and Violet. And so it, they just seem to be cutting a lot of corners and, 
more so than ever before, it seems like they are trying to cash in on Pokemon purely to make money above all else. And there just needs to be a little bit more love put into this series moving forward with this continual cadence of remaking old games and creating new entries. And, you know, hopefully like the Scarlet and Violet DLC um, is good here in the next couple months. I, I know that's kind of off topic with this episode yeah. but anyway like like they're just you gotta do better in the future and i would prefer if they didn't outsource their remakes moving forward either like i ilca did fine on this one but they're just keep it in house in the future i think would be best yeah so a couple of tidbits just as far as reception goes brilliant diamond and shining pearl as of september of last year of 22 have sold just shy of 15 million units. <laughs> so 14.92 million, uh, put that in a little bit of context. Scarlet and Violet, as of August of 23, have sold uh, 22.66 million. Uh, Arceus has sold 14.83 million, and Sword and Shield has sold uh, just shy of 26 million. So it's in line. Uh, with sales and then the Pokemon yeah. company, I don't know if you saw this. I think you were off that uh, that week, or you were work, you were somewhere else working. But uh, a little website called ComicBook.com asked the Pokemon CEO. I, are, I did. COO, I did. I yeah. I did see this actually. Um, they had addressed you know the quality and the release pacing as well there. So they're aware. I mean they're astutely aware after Scarlet and Violet and Nintendo actually issued a public apology, which I don't believe has ever happened in the history of Pokemon. Well, I, I wanted to go ahead and throw this out too. Like I know I mentioned that some fans weren't like thrilled about, um, this is not the greatest barometer of all time. I realize that, but like even Metacritic, if you look at user scores on Metacritic, Omega oh, Ruby yeah. sits at Ome Omega Ruby sits at a 7.5 user score by comparison. Brilliant diamond is at a 5.3. And they are at about similar user scores across the board with both of them. So, yeah. I, I, so user like, scores are, I don't. It's stupid, <laughs> I know. But like. I, What's The Last of Us Part 2's review score? Yeah, user but review I, score. It's dumb. I get it. But it does kind of it does kind of back up the point I was making. that Like these are considered the worst remakes of the four remakes they've ever sure, done. Sure, 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 sure. So, um, yeah. Hey, and I only it's mentioned only that slightly. What was Diamond and Pearl? User score? 5.3, I think. <laughs> Last was part two, 5.8. <laughs> that, that went up. <laughs> people, have, people have been fighting in the battlefields on that one. I think they deleted a lot of the zeros on that one. Like a, a lot of the review bombing, I think they got under control. Well, that's the good. They should get it in control in general. There's one thing, though, that I do think the remake has done pretty well. The music? Yeah, baby. It's pretty good. Yeah. Dude. This music is amazing. <laughs> I this is not this is my favorite. And this is probably the most nostalgic I'm going to get. Yeah. I was going to say cuz this is absolutely not my favorite Pokémon soundtrack. Okay. Let's let's get something clear. First of all, forever indebted to you for introducing me to none other than Carlos Ein, aka Insane in the Rain music. Uh, in the year that he was doing Cinovation, his complete jazz arrangement of the entire Diamond and Pearl soundtrack. So there's going to be a link to that in the show notes as well, alongside the official music, both for the DS and these remakes. But this game has banger battle music. I think that bouncing piano, it just gets me moving, man. I'm grooving. I'm going back and forth. I'm ready to fight. I think it's so... I think every battle theme is a banger in this game. Cynthia is one of the all-time greats. Uh, I know you didn't really go in the post game all that much, but that whole collection of Route 225 through 228, it's the same theme for those that little loop back there, is awesome. It's so, so good. There's a mystical quality, which I think ties to the whole lore thing, the way the game opens up with that kind of like... You know, the little chime, that chime sound kind of coming through. I, I love everything in this game. This is like, I, I know this soundtrack so, so well. And I love it so, so much. And 
having real instruments this time around is awesome. Snow, Snow Point City. Oh my gosh. One of the all time great snow levels. <laughs> this is not, so this is not my favorite Pokemon soundtrack. But mm. what I will say about this soundtrack is that the songs that are good are among the best in the entire series. Mm-hmm. Across the board, I don't. Across the board, I don't think it has my favorites. Um, but again, yeah, Cynthia's theme song there at the end is is great. Um, some of the route themes, uh, the uh, lake themes, phenomenal, mm. fantastic. Snow Point, fantastic. Like those are those are some of the best. I think Snow Snow Point's one of my favorites, and then. Um, the the lake theme is actually probably one of my favorites and it is probably my favorite in the entire game. Yeah, so um, I think the core battle song, like you were talking about how you love it so much, not my favorite. It's actually much lower on like the battle themes of all the Pokemon games. I don't care for it that much. Give me um, the piano over the trumpet, baby. Nah, the trumpet, baby. The trumpet <laughs> from the trumpet. Let's go. Uh, yeah, I, I think this soundtrack is very good. And that and like you said, I think this game's merits is a remake um did do pretty well when it comes to the uh touched up the the touched up score this time around. I didn't felt I didn't feel like they lost any of the uh charm that the original game had. And in a lot of instances I feel like the newer recordings only uh, made these made these songs better. Yeah, um, for the most part. Um, there's something about Cynthia's theme, though, that I think does jam way harder on the, ori- <laughs> on the original. <laughs> Sometimes, I th- so those harder songs, it's like when, you, when all you've got is kind of that, you know, chiptune sound library, like they can really just. Yeah, the atmospheric stuff, out, man. The atmospheric songs, I think, translate really well to the remakes, but it's something, yeah, those hard, like, battle themes, I think, sound better on the on the sort of chiptune side um, with the original DS. But yeah, largely, that is one of the best aspects of these games as remakes and of these games as a whole. Like, again, I'm not saying Pokemon Across the Board has fantastic music, so if I say I'm not a huge fan of a soundtrack, like, Diamond and Pearl's music is still better than a lot of other video game music. It is just not, it is not my favorite in the same way that I know it is like with mm-hmm. yours. Um, there is a generation of kids that kind of grew up with these games that are, I mean, you're in a unique situation obviously because right. you didn't play them for a couple of years, but this is like zoomers first Pokemon. <laughs> I feel like in some way, um, I'll be and I've been with the zoomers. And I feel like a lot of people from that age group are really harp on these these games soundtracks. I think it's the most powerful nostalgic like anchor point in any of these games is the music because music in general just has a unique ability to take you back somewhere, right? Just like a, a the smell of something, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like when I wrote like I'm home. It's you know it's that opening video with the chimes and the. Like the whole thing, and it just—I totally forgot about that because I hadn't watched that in so long, and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah. this is how this opens." Because I was so used to you watch it the first time you boot it up, and then you skip past it every single other time you play it. And so you just—that truly was the most powerful part, I think, in bringing me back. So I was just so excited every town, um, you know. And then, you know, it's also fairly recent in my brain because I was listening to Sinovation pretty hardcore after you had introduced me to it so like it's not like I've, i hadn't heard these songs in over a di- you know in 15 years or i guess yeah 15 years geez so it's all fairly fresh so it's it's good stuff man i love spear pillar oh my gosh it takes me back to the brawl days too remember when that was a yeah. level in brawl Yes, I do. Alkia would flip the stage. Was cool. There was a ton of like spinoffs now that I think about this too. Like they had the it was a Pokemon Revolution on the Wii was one of the games. Yeah, that think. was like the the Coliseum or uh, yeah. stadium equivalent. There was a lot of spinoffs this era. Like all the yeah, Ranger there... games, all the Rescue Team games, all the Troze, Dash, yeah. I think. There was a lot uh, going on with Pokemon <laughs> right around here. Yeah, they um, really went for it. Let's talk about this game's legacy close out mm. this episode i don't think there's anything else that we've 
not yeah. touched on. Let me say this up front. So as we've talked about this over the course of this episode, I have softened a bit on my stance with this game. I do not think this that's game all, that's is... That's all I wanted. It's not... If I was going to rank everything we've played so far this season, would this be last? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but I don't think... It, it's not horrible. I just think there is not enough unique in this game to have it stand out within the larger series. And then... That combined with the like disappointments with the Pokédex, uh, I think is what are the big letdowns for me with this game. Um, is just that it kind of plays the greatest hits of Pokemon. Of there's a there's a, a legendary and a and you got to fight the gyms and there's an evil team and then uh, yeah. So it just this game could have been much better than it is, and I feel like as the pokemon franchise's first jump to the ds there is more they could have done um from like a mechanic side of thing like it really just they they didn't really take great advantage of the hardware and i don't feel like they really i feel like black and white is where things kind of start to get i I don't know i just i I like black and white a lot more but anyway um as far as this game's legacy this is one that's hard for me to kind of like pin a legacy on within the larger scope of the series because I don't really know. These games compared to a lot of others are just kind of there. I mean, obviously its legacy is that it was the first on the DS, which went mm-hmm. on to be a long string of releases across. I mean, if, you, if you're if you counting the whole DS system of families like this up until Ultra Sun, like that's a string of like so many games in there like 10 15 games if you're counting all the versions of each um so th- th- this is a big deal in that regard um and so yeah i i don't know but but i don't think the series itself really grew until some of the later entries that they came out with so it's it's hard for me to say that this feels like a turning point for pokemon overall it really just does kind of feel like the franchise's first pivot to new hardware. Whereas I felt like, for example, with Ruby and Sapphire, not only did it go to new hardware, but they they did some new things with the hardware and stuff like that that were a little bit more integral to the game rather than just, hey, what if you chiseled fossils in this wall with your DS pin? You know, like... Yeah, yeah. Th- th- it, w- it was all kind of more novelty stuff that they did rather than being more tied to gameplay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, you know, legacy from a personal angle is just, you know, this is like, this is my generation that I identify with. But in the grand scheme of Pokemon, outside of that DS run that you just talked about, really kicking off the longest running stretch and platform for Pokemon to be on, there is... uh, a, the lore of Pokemon, I think, really branches out from here. Not just because Sinnoh's the start or whatever, but this is like the middle of the decks, you know? This kind of upper 400s. Now we're in the back half of this thousands. And, you know, we got the first... This is stretching a little bit. But we got kind of the first new idea of what Pokemon could be like with Legends Arceus. And it's built off of the the decks <laughs> of this game and the the world and the environment. And it's kind of leaning into that lore. And it I played Arceus before we really sunk our teeth into this season. Maybe I was playing Leaf Green around the same time. I don't exactly remember. But I don't I hadn't been that excited about a Pokemon game in I guess probably since X and Y, just because I was excited to come back to the series again because I took a self-imposed break for some unknown reason. And it and but Arceus is actually good, and I think that's kind of cool that it extends out of this generation. And I, as you were talking, I was looking at the sales figures of kind of the core games over time, and um, Diamond and Pearl are the fifth best-selling Pokemon games. Yeah. And then if you take if you take Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, they 
they're up there with red, green, and blue, but I guess I'd have to throw in Let's Go Pikachu and stuff with that. But a lot of people have played this yeah. particular generation. Everybody think, back in the day like had these games, absolutely. Like Yeah. I, everybody was, I knew who had a DS had one of these games, either Pearl, Diamond, or Platinum. Yeah. It's it was a strong generation. And I but I think it it just got the games got better later on on the DS in particular, like that core DS. And I'll say this. Having come back and played, I've, I've enjoyed that. But I am truly amped for black and white and black and white too. I hope you enjoy it. Dude, I'll say this though. And I, I want to, this segues well. A lot of my, you can see where I would have been at at this point in time. Because I never really liked this Dex back in the day. I always thought this Dex had problems. So going from this Gen 4 into Gen 5 where they were like, everything is new. We're creating a whole Dex that is new top to bottom. No returning Pokemon. I thought that was so freaking cool at the yeah, time. And I, I still think do. that's cool. <laughs> I think that's still awesome. Like, I wish they would do that more often. I think they lean too heavily on past generations, whereas black and white have always shown me that, like, if they just go into full creative mode, and again, people give those games crap, I know, because not every Pokemon's design knocks it out of the park, but, like, conceptually, I think they should do that more because mm. this Diamond and Pearl does have problems with its decks, as we've talked about in this episode, but... um I just yeah their creativity was w way cooler and I just think the vibe that that black and white have is way more unique as a result like I like those games a lot and I'm I'm very much looking forward to playing them I'm, as well on my amp um one more quick quick thing about legacy and it's not something we really would have brought up or thought to have brought up but it just hit me these are also the first pokemon games to go online Trade with friends, battle with friends, all over the world. Yeah, and, that's true. And really, the ability to keep your Pokemon all the way back from the GBA to today. Wireless trading would have been a thing. Wireless thing. trading is Without all possible little... because of the DS. Yeah. The hard the hardware definitely unlocked Pokemon in ways like that. Like that you could mm -hmm. you finally didn't have to, you know, buy Leaf Greed and Fire Red and get a trade, a wireless trading thing dongle in, in, thing yeah yeah or link in with it or yeah it's yeah a lot of the a lot of the barriers of pokemon were broken down with these games but that's by proxy of what the ds allowed for um yeah. so that's that's a cool thing in, in that regard for sure yeah and i just i really think it's so flipping neat that someone like logan if you hadn't sold it you could have still you could have brought those pokemon up into scarlet and violet like it's Tech and at the end of the season, you've talked about it, and I want to do it too. Migrating the Pokemon over, doing yes. the great Pokemon Home import, and bringing everything up that you can bring up, and even with the 3DS and the Virtual Console, there, uh, rest in peace, eShop. You know, there's PokeBank integration in those Virtual Console versions of Gold, Silver, Red, Blue, Yellow, and and Crystal. So, truly. It was all unlocked with the DS and, uh, you know, Diamond and Pearl play a factor in that. Yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to doing my mass export once we get to the end of the season. Maybe I should start doing it as we approach. Otherwise, you, that's you going to be You maybe should start because it's a little slow. You can only do yes. one game at a time. <laughs> yes, once I get them over to Switch, it'll be a faster process. But actually, you know what the, you know what the problem is? Is like black and white are kind of the linchpin to get them ported to black and white too right you have to have that to get to the 3ds i don't think it's black and white too i think it's i think it's the first black and white games work too but those are the linchpins uh to get everything to 3ds i believe yeah you've so. got to go through black and white <laughs> so, so it's gonna be a we can do it together buddy i guess i could do that though because i did buy uh you both i did buy all ver i have all versions of black and white and black and white too um, and I'm going to play the ones I bought or whatever that I spent copious mm -hmm. amounts of money on for the season. Good, good for you. Which is <laughs> which segues into our membership sponsorship or our membership <laughs> plug here at the end. Please uh, subscribe to our membership program so that I can afford these insanely expensive video games. Thank you. 
Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> sure, we'll take it from there because I think that does do it for Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Platinum. We'll clear Platinum a bone. So thank you to our members who support us directly and help finance um, keeping the show, keeping the lights on, and uh, helping Logan buy these games. He now has a complete DS set, so good for him. Castlevania is looming as well, just kind of on the horizon. So uh, thank you to our members. You can get access to longer episodes, exclusive bonus videos like our Pokemon battles for this season, and uh, exclusive episodes. We may do one for Legends Arceus uh, here. So that could be an exciting episode for members as well. So thank you all for supporting us. You can learn more by heading over to listeningwithsuperpower.com. As for the show, you can follow it on Twitter at Chapter Select and go over to chapterselect.com and see all of our past seasons there and future seasons as well. For Logan, you can follow him at moreman12 and his writing over at comicbook.com. And myself at maxroberts143 and all my writing over at maxfrequency.net as well as my other show, The Max Frequency Podcast. Uh, so you can check all of that out. Thank you all so much. And until next time, adios. Chapter Select is a Max Frequency production. Chapter Select is supported by you. You can gain access to longer episodes and bonus content by going to chapterselect.com forward slash join. This episode was researched, produced, and edited by me, Max Roberts. Season 6 is hosted by Logan Moore and myself. Season 6 is all about Pokemon. For more on the season, go to chapterselect.com forward slash season 6. You can follow the show at Chapter Select and check out previous seasons at chapterselect.com. Yeah, it's just... Hold on. Do you hear that? Yeah, that's Slade. He's having a bad dream. Oh, he's asleep? He's asleep. <laughs> I just assumed he was barking at someone. No, no, no. He's yelping in his sleep. That's hilarious. Body.